Good evening and good afternoon uh, for Istanbul and Prague and good morning for New York uh, for today uh, on, on our uh, international cooperation platform panel. We have a very honorable two distinguished uh, guest panelists uh, for talking about uh, what we have to talk for the international uh, diplomacy and also for the international institutions. Our first honorable uh, panelist is uh, Mr. Miguel Angel uh, Moratinos. Uh, very welcome, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, it's a higher pleasure uh, to be uh, with you uh, on, uh, on this panel. And our second uh, uh, distinguished guest, our honorable guest, uh, uh, His Excellency, Mr. Egemen Baş. Uh, he is uh, uh, the ambassador of Turkey to Prague. Uh, very welcome, uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, for this panel. Uh, and thank you for having us. Uh, and I would like to thank very much uh, for your uh, uh, for your big support uh, for uh, Mr. Uh, Moratinos uh, to be together on this panel. Exactly. Thank uh, you, Mr. Moratinos. Uh, I am I am I'm really happy uh, to read your uh, biography and I would like to uh, I'm totally sure that I would like to be a moderator of conference of series to listen all the marvelous moments of the recent history of the Cold War uh, the Middle East and the regional and international uh, diplomacy uh, uh, for all your all your career, so uh, I I really apologize to give only a brief summary of your career uh, for this moment. Don't worry. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Uh, Moritanos, uh, His Excellency, uh, he is a lifelong diplomat and a politician with uh, countless stars on his shoulders a career dedicated to peace and development. His early career saw him uh, exile through various important positions in Yugoslavia and Morocco and Israel. After that, he was appointed as a European Union special representative uh, for the Middle East peace process, where he efficiently fostered the Arab-Israel dialogue. Then he went on and became the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Cooperation, International Cooperation of Spain. During his term, he held the presidency of the United Nations Security Council and chaired uh, OC, uh, OCCS, the Council of Europe and Council of the European Union. A teacher at uh, uh, Sciences Po Paris, uh, honor, honorary chair of the Center for International Relations and Sustainable Development and United Nations High Representative for the Alliance of Civilizations. Uh, thank you uh, being together again. Thank you very much. I'm very honored, very privileged to take part on this uh, discussion. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, we have uh, Mr. Egemen Baş, our second honorable uh, guest uh, for the panel, whom after finishing his studies in the United States and holding important positions such as the president of Federation of Turkish American Associations, turned back to Turkey and served his country as the chief foreign policy advisor to, to do then Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan, uh, our president, his vigor and success saw him as the Minister of State and the chief negotiator of Turkey to the European Union. Uh, between 2011 2013, he was appointed as the Minister of European Union Affairs. And since 2019, uh, uh, our distinguished guest, uh, Mr. Egemen Baş, is the ambassador of Turkey uh, to Prague. So uh, for the for the two distinguished guests. I have five questions and uh, we have only one hour uh, for uh, for this panel. So uh, I, I secondly 
uh, I have to apologize for these five questions and very uh, maybe very short answers. It's just like uh, we can talk many, perhaps days of days uh, for these questions. Uh, our first question is the 21st century has left uh, behind 20 years within which uncertainties had been felt deeply and countries struggled to unit under a common future. How would you evaluate this period, uh, Mr. Uh, Moritanos first, then Mr. Egemen? Well, thank you very much for uh, convening this uh, uh, debate, this uh, webinar, and, and give me the, the opportunity to thank uh, you and uh, Bosphorus uh, uh, summit, I was supposed to attend this summit, unfortunately it had to be uh, postponed due to the COVID-19, but it's a good occasion to have in front of me in the screen my dear friend Egeman and yourself and to share with all of you some of my thoughts in this particular, I think, extremely uh, critical moment. Uh, in order to, to be brief and to answer your question, then we can interact between Egemen and myself. I will agree with you that uh, unfortunately we are already in 2020. So that means the 20 year has elapsed and it seems that the world community, world leaders, uh, international community has not uh, understood that we are in a different century. Unfortunately, in the 20th century, we had to go through two world wars, the first in 1914 to 1919, and then second world war that it went to 1945. That means that half a century was a lost period of time where uh, countries, nations uh, tried to figure out how they could uh, establish a common environment to live together. So half a century was lost. Uh, we didn't learn from history, unfortunately. And we were already, and I'm sure Egerman will agree with me, during the last uh, uh, 20 years, when we started this century, the 21st century, we were already aware that we have to change the way we conduct international relations. So, um, political uh, leadership knew that they have to re reform the instrument and the organization that are the product of the 20th century. And we are on the 21st century. So I will answer to your question and say yes. Unfortunately, uh, we have lost to 20 years because we knew that we have to start to move forward and to offer a different uh, paradigm, a different uh, way to conduct the public uh, relationship between countries and nations, and we didn't have succeed till now. COVID-19, I think it has a positive element is that it has brutally put in the table that we cannot continue like uh, business as usual. We cannot continue closing our eyes, saying that there is no change, there is no need for reform. Yes. so. I think now people are aware that uh, we have to start work to try to find new formulas, new proposals, in order that we can really respond to the global challenges that this uh, COVID-19 has uh, uh, exposed to us so clearly, so brutally. So that is my answer. Yes, we have lost 20 years, but we need now to rush and to have, you know, possibility to start to develop a new strategy in order to have a better world. Mr. Bosch? Well, thank you. I also would like to thank you, the organizers of the Bosporus Conference in Istanbul for bringing me and my good friend and mentor, uh, Miguel Moritinos, together on this very uh, timely and interesting topic. Uh, the Americans have a saying, if you want to joke with God, make plans. Miguel and I were supposed to be in our way back from St. Petersburg these days, because every year we gather in St. Petersburg, because Miguel is the chairman of the advisory board of the University of Humanities of St. Petersburg, and I'm a proud member 
of his board and we convene every year and give speeches to the university students and also we discuss world events but all of our plans had to change and now i'm in prague he's in new york you're in istanbul and people from all around the globe are watching us about how the united nations have dealt with this crisis and what we should do in the upcoming period about how the world should be governed. Well, one thing is for sure, we are now living in a different world and nothing will be the same. We just realized that our measuring capabilities of strong countries were not based on the realities that we witnessed. As a matter of fact, I'm sure Miguel would agree with me, the permanent members of the Security Council, whom we thought were the strongest countries, who had the most powerful vehicles to deal with every problem that we could imagine, all the wealth, all the nuclear powers, all the war missionaries, could not help them and they became the most vulnerable victims of Corona. So I agree with Miguel that the last 20 years, we have not prepared some for something of this sort, but we were prepared for other things. We were ready for world wars. We were ready for isolation. We were ready for uh, different centers of powers uh, emerging, but we were not ready for a small virus that only microscopes can locate, uh, not to perish us. So we have to withdraw some important lessons, not only for United Nations, but all international organizations and all uh, governments will have to change their planning methodology from now on. And we have to prepare the future of our children and we have to realize staying alive is more important than having all the arms, having all the richnesses. So the health has to become our priority again. Uh, I would like to continue for the uh, second question uh, uh, with you, Mr. Uh, Bausch. Uh, 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 on, in one hand, uh, I would like to say that uh, you are uh, one of the most honorable supporters uh, for the Bosphorus Summit and also for the International Cooperation Platform, an honorable member of the International uh, Cooperation Platform. Uh, so uh, uh, we will never finish to thanks about that. Uh, for the second question, uh, uh, you and uh, Mr. Uh, Moratinos would you agree that the efforts of the international institutions during this period were inadequate? Well, uh, we have to agree that they were not prepared for a pandemic of this magnitude. And many countries are complaining about the lack of cooperation, but uh, not only United Nations, especially European Union did not provide as much support to her member countries. And I think Miguel is better equipped to respond to that because he has served very successfully as the foreign minister of foreign affairs of Spain, a country that suffered a lot during the Corona incident. And uh, the public perception of EU was much stronger but unfortunately, EU is only discussing how to help member countries' economies in the aftermath of thousands of people losing their lives. So in terms of being prepared with enough ventilators, with masks, with uh, disinfectants, EU was short. And we just realized that this disease uh, treated every country every nation and even at times every human being different. When Prime Minister of United Kingdom 
was sick, you could see millions of refugees in different UN camps staying healthy under much worse conditions, with much less food, with much less uh, health care. But somehow, it just realized that international organizations, states, governments, institutions, nobody was really prepared for something of this magnitude. In the beginning of Corona, I was in Frankfurt for a business trade fair, and people were hesitating, walking into the booths where there were some Chinese salespeople or Chinese individuals, uh, even Orientals. And people would come to a booth and say, don't worry, I'm Korean. But in a few weeks, we realized that this is not a problem that is located only in the borders of Wuhan. Now we have to understand, as President Erdogan said numerous times at the General Assembly of United Nations, that the world is bigger than five. And unless we all cooperate, unless we all work together, we are all at risk. So international organizations were not adequate, I agree, but we have to change the way we think and we have to change and go back to our main basic human principles. Taking care of our health, eating healthy, getting enough sleep, caring about the problems of others, not isolating ourselves, not ignoring the shortcomings of other nations has to become our priority. And we all saw that uh, some of the very small countries like Slovakia did much better than some of the large countries like China or Russia or United States or England. So we have to withdraw the necessary lessons. We have to learn from this or else this is going to continue. Uh, yes. Mr. Moritanos, uh, on my side, I would like to give an example from the economical side. Uh, as like uh, in 2007, uh, we, uh, most of the economists uh, on the international side, we, we began to discuss something happened from the mortgage crisis coming from United States for all international financial system. But unfortunately, even we talk in 2007 uh, between us from the emails and also some seminars, uh, some panels, somehow we didn't see any, any phrases on the IMF and World Bank reports about, uh, the, about this issue. And also similar thing uh, for the World Health Organization in the 14 days, 14th of January this year, uh, there is no pandemic uh, problem uh, for the COVID-19. And after 15 days, at the 29th of January, there is a higher risk of, uh, of global pandemic uh, for COVID-19. So what's going on uh, for these uh, institutions? And do you think uh, the international institutions need to be reformed? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I fully agree with the intervention of my friend Egerman, I mean, uh, the world was not prepared. International organizations were not uh, ready for answering to this new global crisis. Uh, it's absolutely unfortunate. Uh, you can imagine a nanovirus, a small virus, put the world totally in total collapse. So can you imagine if we have another kind of uh, virus or what kind of, kind of uh, civil war, a cyber war or hacker? So how, how we are going to respond? And I think uh, what uh, Egemen said, that uh, uh, they show the vulnerability of the, the state and the nations and the main ones. I mean, uh, he mentioned the P5 in the Security Council, but it is true that it is quite uh, surprising 
to see that the main leaders in the most developed countries are the ones who have suffered more of this COVID-19. They should be the one better prepared, but they were not uh, doing the prevention elements of uh, any kind of diplomacy. You know, there was in uh, 2005, uh, and I uh, recommend you, you could read because it's now public of the report of the CIA, I mean, it's uh, United States Intelligence Service. In 2005, page 111, he said exactly what has happened with this virus. He announced that in 2020 will be a kind of virus coming from Asia that will put the whole world politically, economically, and socially at the stake. So what well, it didn't take any measure because people were not uh, identifying the real, let's say, challenge. They were much more concerned about uh, uh, the hegemony of one or another. They were more concerned about their own unilateral interest, but they were not sharing the responsibility to prepare the world for answering to this crisis. And in order to answer Egemen about the, the international relations response and particularly the European Union, I agree with him that uh, the, the response and the effort have not been uh, successful. Let me be frank. I mean, uh, I mean uh, everybody has done its utmost. Everybody has tried to avoid uh, this crisis. Uh, the WHO has now trying to undermine and try to give some answer. But the result is that we have, uh, you know, more than 7 million people infected and around half a million of people died in the world. So it's not a good, uh, a good result. So we cannot uh, say that we international organizations have done their, their best. No, let's be frank. We have uh, shown our fragility, our uh, shortcomings, and that we have to, to change. That's happened also with European Union. I think now, now we have to be, I have to balance a little bit the criticism coming from Egemen. At the beginning, I will agree with him. Uh, they were surprised, they were shocked, they were not uh, really um, ready to show this uh, solidarity clause of the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, they didn't understand that uh, what's happening in Italy could affect the others, so everybody look uh, inwards and not uh, sharing responsibility. And there was nothing at the level of public opinion, as Egemen said. There was no mask, there was no uh, ventilator, they didn't share uh, each hospital, so it was not a European Union spirit. Uh, and I think uh, they didn't invent how they, they use this uh, pandemic in order to show that they are united. And that was at the beginning very negative, and the image was very negative. Thanks God, I think they have now moved forward to a much more positive agenda with a recovery plan, with a very strong uh, financial package that will uh, allow the European countries to overcome a lot of social and economic, uh, you know, challenges that they have each of them, and I hope that uh, while well, still they have to be approved, there is two, two or three countries in European Union, the the very strict the people uh, country that they uh, consider the monetary uh, crisis have to be uh, adapted with very tight policies, and they don't understand the need for support and solidarity at this stage. But I think. At the end of the day, uh, the proposal of France and Germany and uh, the European Commission of the President of the European Commission, I think at the end they're going to open the way for a re rebirth of the trust and confidence of the European Union. There is a possibility, and, and I hope uh, I hope that 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 it will be that will be uh, that will be done in the in the future. So um, you mentioned. Uh, Mr. Alkin, the crisis of the financial um, uh, crash in 2007. I remember myself at that time I was foreign minister and uh, Spain uh, succeeded to join the G20. 
and uh, the, the whole financial system was collapsing and they need, you know, um, to really respond to that. And so the U.S. was collapsing in the financial system, so the European Union and the French uh, presidency and others said, let's call for a first uh, leader G20 meeting because till that time there was not a meeting at the level of prime minister of head of state. There was only means of finance. And so the first G20 meeting at the highest level was convened by the United States in, 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 in 2009, I think, from 2010. At that time, I remember people were afraid. The whole system was collapsing. And there were some interesting papers to reform the IMF, to reform the World Bank, and to have a different approach for the financial issue. Unfortunately, as soon as the economy restart to be more or less the same, people forgot about the reform process. And this, uh, I remember, was a fantastic paper of Gordon Brown trying to really reformulate the places and the balance of power within the IMF and how we should uh, address the issue. It was put aside. And then we continued business as usual. So what I mentioned on that, today we have not a financial crisis. Either. We have a global crisis. It's not a health crisis. It's not a financial, it's economic. It's all about all is included because the situation shows the complexity of today's reality. So what we have to do, we are going to do as uh, always say, let's make some superficial change and then business as usual, we will continue to do as if nothing has happened. That will be a tremendous mistake. So I really mm, encourage uh, that uh, we will uh, pursue uh, certain, you know, need for reform, for radical reform in the international institution. Because we are not people, we have shown that we are not really ready to answer this uh, crisis and the challenges. So uh, imagine if uh, next crisis is a, a cyber or telecommunication crisis. Till now we have now this instrument to see each other through a, a split screen. And I saw you in Istanbul, Egemen in Prague. But imagine lockdown without communication. So we have a combination of a virus crisis, health crisis with telecommunication crisis. What, what will be the response? How we are going to really uh, be able to understand each other and to reform? So, we need to take this crisis extremely serious and not to just close our eyes and say, well, we are now under the confinement, we are now better, we feel that the things are coming back. Be careful, the world has changed and we have to change. Thank you. Uh, from this question, I would like to add another one. Uh, 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 very uh, similar to the uh, third question, uh, Mr. Bash. Uh, do you think uh, the United Nations is ready for revoking the weight or right of the five permanent members in the Security Council? Do you think international uh, politics will constitute a just and equal system? Well, uh... United Nations is ready, but the permanent members are not ready. And unfortunately, we have a deadlock. Changing the UN system is a must for it to be really inclusive. But the rules of the change, the procedures on how to change the system, require the consensus of the Security Council members as well. So it's a chicken and egg story, which came first. But we all saw that the current system is not adequate to respond to the world's problems. And those who should have been helping others ended up asking for help. 
absolutely. I. It, you want to of say course, something well, else? Yeah. Of course, of course. Well, I think I, I fully agree with Egerman. I mean, unfortunately, Security Council is totally blocked. I, it has been extremely unfortunate. It's a real failure in the whole system. Can you imagine that the central um, element of the system cannot uh, agree in this uh, so extremely challenging uh, crisis that after three months, they has not been able to even uh, draft a resolution of consensus. That shows the limits of this Security Council. We cannot continue forever in this sense. So uh, I don't think they are going to change because uh, you know we've been through the last 30 years trying to see there is uh, some reform, some uh, changes. We can't change even the agenda. We thought, I thought at the beginning with this issue of uh, virus, of health, of uh, uh, food security, climate change, we could have a consensus in the council. But what showed that today everything is interrelated. It's not only health, it's not a health crisis. It's a political crisis. It's the fight between two superpowers. Is who is going to be the one who have a better position after the crisis. So there is a, a, a real um, fight behind the screen that need that the whole system have to change. And it's not just uh, to change the Security Council, it's to change the whole uh, system. I mean, I, 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 I think if I will have uh, some uh, advice, if they are ask me some advice for how we should uh, pursue this uh, this uh, new uh, period of time is that uh, well we have the G20 the main uh, important countries are represented there so instead of course to discuss economic and financial issues that are very good are always very welcome but as uh, the Secret Council doesn't work I think the only format where the people meet and are able is this uh, G20. And I will ask, I mean, the, 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 the leaders to make a poll, to say, well, my dear friend, uh, put paper out um, on site. We are not going to discuss the agenda that Sherpa has prepared to us. Let's discuss what we are going to do together, how we are going to live uh, together. Uh, let's make a poll, because the, the complexity of the world today is so high that we don't understand what is the consequences. So then we try to, of course, the first uh, challenge is to stop the, the, the pandemic. Okay, that they will do trying to, but then immediately there are economic and social and consequences. Then there are cultural consequences. There is xenophobia, discrimination, Islamophobia. You know what, what is coming. So we cannot, separate one crisis from one area from another area. So um, for that, I think the leaders need to have a kind of, um, let's say, a comprehensive approach in order to see how we are going to start the process of reform on the international organization. In one hand, we, we have really higher problems on the international diplomacy. But on the other hand, as the same uh, questions for the international trade too. I would like to share as an, another example from the World Trade Organization. Uh, after the acceptance of the China uh, for the being the member of the World Trade Organization, uh, everybody knows that uh, the, comp uh, the uh, competitiveness of China uh, become to be a very uh, disturbing subject uh, for the United States and some other countries. And what happened? Uh, because of the attitude of the United States in World Trade Organization, the international arbitration for global trade problems and discussions, unfortunately, at that moment, is totally collapsed. So, uh, so that's why uh, maybe the major countries has to find uh, a, a way 
uh, to not uh, disturbing uh, the international institutions uh, for their job, uh, I think, Mr. Moritan, Moritanos. Well, I, I agree with you. We are uh, the example of the, uh, the World Trade Organization is uh, one example that showed that nothing is uh, uh, limited to a certain area. Of course, they are talking about trade. But let me ask, uh, I mean, the people say it was a mistake to allow China to enter the World Trade Organization. What is a mistake? Can you imagine China outside the international rules? How, I mean, at least now we, we, he has now a certain advantage because when he en entered, he was a so-called developing country. Uh, and so he benefited from that. Well, that you have then to negotiate, to rearrange the equilibrium. But can you imagine China outside the international framework? Or can you imagine the international framework without the United States? So um, it's not a question of the framework. It's a question of how member states negotiate and have a deal. And for this deal, again, we come to what I call diplomacy with capital D. That means it's a political negotiation. So if you don't get an agreement between China and the United States, you have to be very difficult to set some rules that can't really be uh, adapted and shared by the majority. And the others, we have to really say what is our concern, what are our interests. Today, everybody has the right to express their concern. This, this uh, uh, single leadership of this uh, uh, G2 or G7, I mean, it's over. Today, every country has the right and the legitimacy to express their concern. But nevertheless, we know we know we are not naive that the two big countries start to, to, to have difficulties to understand each other. So for that, you need diplomacy. And you need to have, uh, you know, understanding. And that's, I think, what he has missing because uh, uh, there is no third party. The European Union has no play the possibility for European Union to try to really help the two parties to understand, to set certain rules. So um, time for diplomacy, but the real diplomacy is back, but have to be implemented. It's not enough uh, just to discuss and to say we are going to do. No, we have to do. Tweet diplomacy. Uh, Zoom diplomacy, as we are doing today, uh, has its limits. You know that the people meet and they, they have, well, what are the Chinese uh, interests, what the United States, how we can get uh, some compromise. Uh, I don't think the situation is more complicated than during the Cold War, uh, where the Soviet and United States were fighting at that time, it was an ideological uh, conflict. There was a nuclear conflict. Uh, the, the, the issues were also extremely difficult. And then they, they succeeded to live together and to create some rules to respect each other. So what it is needed today is to reopen the dialogue and to try to find formula for reshaping you know, the organization and the global government. Mr. Bash, uh, I would like to continue with our last question, uh, especially for the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic period. How do you think international institutions manage uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic? How will this contribute to, to the culture of acting together from the perspective of the future? Well, Years ago, Miguel and I worked very close and served our two leaders. He was very close to Prime Minister Zapatero of Spain, and I was very close to then Prime Minister Erdogan of Turkey. And the two leaders, with the leadership of United Nations, established an idea called Alliance of Civilizations. This was in a way, the Turkish-Spanish reaction towards the threat, the fear 
that humanity had, which was clash of civilizations. We worked very hard on it, and it was supported by the United Nations, and many countries endorsed the project. And today, United Nations has an organization called the High Office of Alliance of Civilizations, and the high representative is Miguel Moratinos. And I'm very honored to be among his advisors and on, on his board. And the importance of this entity, cooperation, became more evident during the corona pandemic crisis. Because unfortunately, until now, we were discriminating against some nations and we were ignoring the problems of the others. So if Israel was annexing some parts of Palestine and building houses, it was a problem there in the Middle East. If there was hunger in Africa, as long as we're not there, we didn't think it would affect us. Just like the fact that some potential viruses in Asia. And Miguel just saw some reports warned us 15 years ago, but unfortunately humanity did not do much in response to those warnings. The problems in Kashmir, the fact that we still have an unsolved problem in Cyprus. The fact that more than a million Azeris are homeless because of Armenian invasion. These problems all require close attention. And as Miguel said a while ago, it requires diplomacy. For humanity to survive, not only the continuation of the corona problem, but also potential other problems, we have to realize that as in our culture, you cannot sleep if your neighbor is hungry. You cannot ignore the problems of others. As we say in Turkish, if your neighbor's house is on fire and if you don't help them put it out, that fire will eventually burn your own home. We thought a problem in Wuhan would be a Chinese problem. No, it is our problem. It has affected our daily lives. We can't even travel. We can't even see our loved ones. We can't even conduct our normal routine businesses. So we have to realize each and every problem that humanity faces has the potential to become our own problem. So we need much more diplomacy than ever before. We meet, need much more cooperation and we need much more alliance. And we don't have the luxury to say it's their problem because everything is our problem. That's why the Alliance of Civilizations can and should play a very vital role. And I'm so happy that someone with such experience as Miguel is now in charge of this alliance. I am sure that Miguel has already made plans to deal with some of the most acute diplomatic problems and international crisis right after he can travel because all these issues will become much more severe if we don't deal with them early enough. Yes, I, if you allow me uh, to re, re, rebound uh, about my friend Egerman, absolutely. And thank you for your very warm words. And I don't know how much we we are, uh, you know, grateful to Turkey President Erdogan to maintain the lines alive and to support, you know, this uh, UN entity. Uh, it's absolutely true. Today, the lines is more needed than before, than ever. Why? As Egerman was saying, I mean, what is, I think everybody understands now is that the period of the Western uh, 
liberal society is over, or practically over. It's not totally over, but they have to share uh, the guidance and uh, the world with others. So we have to understand they have another partner, that they have another culture, they have another civilization, they have another criteria, they have another uh, values, uh, and that we have to put together all that in order that we can move all together toward a better future. What the COVID-19 has demonstrated, and that is the motto of the Alliance of Civilization, that we are one humanity, the same group that we are gathering every year in St. Petersburg. We decided last year already in advance, imagine, in advance we were already a group of uh, high international personality, personality and our dear friend Egemen is part of that with a very active role. We gather that today a part of uh, nation state, part of international community, we need to shape what is the new form, this one humanity. Everybody now fit, either you are in China, you are in Latin America, you are in Africa, we have been infected. In some cases, uh, unfortunately, but infected by the consequences of this global crisis. So this one humanity has uh, started to revolt because the revolt has seen that the UN Security Council cannot take any action. How we are going, that's one humanity. We are waiting for multilateralism, yes. We are waiting for a given a global response, yes. But we have offered fragmented response, unilateral response. So this one humanity that is taking shape is reacting gradually. And that is one of the next next uh, objective of the launch of civilization. We are the UN entity that we are going to, let's say, facilitate the understanding and the way that each culture and religious and civilization will respond to the whole new challenging world. So uh, it's a huge task because uh, it goes to the heart of the problem. It's not only the economy stupid, as Clinton would say, is not uh, uh, health stupid, is the human being. How we are going to get everybody around certain principles and values that will respond to the challenge of today. So um, uh, we will continue Turkey and Spain and myself trying to revitalize uh, the institution and trying to respond. We will be a kind of uh, conscience of the world, of the UN system. The UN system has a FAO for agriculture, we have a WHO for, for health, we have a uh, w, uh, uh, trade uh, for trade, we have uh, for children, we have, but they need the UN an entity for the global conscience of one humanity. And we can be this global conscience of the UN system in order that we give them the sense where we have to go. We give certain ethics in the action of this, uh, the new international organization. And that is the, the challenge we have and we have to discuss, of course, we have to put into Ground. We are already having a tremendous network of youth in the education, women, religious leaders that are creating a kind of a common platform for responding to this uh, situation. Uh, I would like to finish uh, with a, a bonus question uh, after talking all uh, with uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Moratinos and Mr. Bausch. Uh, if we are looking, if uh, if we are looking all frame, and also including all the international and the regional uh, subjects, discussions, problems, what you would like to say uh, for the for the future of the European Union? Can I start or do I start? Hmm? Up to you. 
Okay, so I'm optimistic about the European Union if, if, if he has the courage to overcome certain constraints of certain member states that are reluctant to more for a much more, from my point of view, federalism. I mean, they have to really be much more united. Uh, the crisis have demonstrated that uh, alone they cannot really be able neither to find the vaccine and nor to respond to the crisis. Uh, yes, they closed the borders for security reasons for a two-month period in order to protect and to avoid this, uh, you know, social distance and this contact, etc. That's okay. But in terms of policy, the only way to, to go is to really have a much more intensive uh, co cooperation between member states. I think we had, uh, the council is working of uh, head of state and government, uh, head of governments are okay. Uh, but uh, the parliament, European parliament is working more or less okay. But uh, the democratic, the economic institution is still are they need a much more democratization process. I think uh, uh, even if we have to respect the independence of the Central Bank of Europe, they have to be much more uh, clarity in what are the policies that we are going to defend within the European Union. And that's, I think, the social agenda have to take a much more important place in the discussion. Uh, social agenda was practically neglected during uh, the Lisbon Treaty due to the British uh, that they didn't want to really include that. Uh, it was part of the negotiation. So now we have a chance maybe without uh, the British to be much more eager to really um, develop a much more democratic uh, analysis and participation of the economic and social decision. Uh, the people of Europe need that. They are happy to receive funds, to receive resources, but at the same time, they have to be able to, to use these resources for what? And so that is the political participation for that. So uh, that's one part. The second part, we need a much more stronger Europe in international affairs. Uh, well, Hegemann will be the one to, to be the witness. Uh, Europe has been a uh, recent last uh, 10 years practically absent in the main uh, important political crisis. There has been no presence in, uh, in the Middle East. I mean, Turkey has played a much better and much substantial role in this, uh, in this part of the world. Uh, you see the Turkish diplomacy going organizing Astana, then getting an agreement with Russia Federation, trying to find the ways in order to stabilize Syria, etc. And, and you don't see <laughs> any European leaders trying to facilitate a deal. Uh, they are too busy worrying about their upcoming elections, I guess. Yes, I see, but I mean, that cannot continue. And now we are going to have a test with uh, the Israeli-Palestinian issue. I hope uh, the Europeans will understand that what at stake uh, with this, uh, let's say, announcement that the Israel is going to annex uh, part of the West Bank and the Jordan Valley. I think uh, Europe should to respond to that and they have to be a, a great player. We can, we have the, I've been an EU special envoy, so I know the tremendous potential of European diplomacy, but we have to use it. And unfortunately, till the last uh, 10 years, I think there was no. Now there's a new, new person. I hope my, my compatriot Borrell is going to be more and more active. I'm sure he's already taking very courageous decisions and statements. So I hope that think, uh, but the Europeans have to really move a little more in the international arena. It's enough to depend on the Atlantic and uh, waiting for certain guidance when our interests are at stake. So we have now to be adults. We are already grown up. We have been already 60 years, you know, uh, after the, the, 
the Rome Treaty. So now is the time for Europe to act. And then I hope that uh, we don't have a hegemon in the negotiation process with the European Union. But, uh, you know, Spain and myself, we will always be in favor of Turkey joining the European Union. You can imagine in this situation if you, Turkey would be in, fully in Europe, you know, all the your, your political challenge, you cannot imagine how they will be solved more easily and with more success. So uh, you add that Turkey to these uh, 27 countries, you can imagine what you can do in the new world. Well, uh, thank you, Miguel. Let me also make an analysis. When I think of European Union, I always believe that it is the grandest peace project of the history of mankind because none of the member states has fired another bullet to another member state. So it has achieved maintaining peace in a very large geography, uh, which has a history of wars and bloodshed and animosities. So European Union is a very important institution that has to go on, but it has to revise itself needs to transform itself and the current decision-making process of the necessity for a unanimity on every small detail cannot continue. We saw that some of the most important elements of European Union, free trade, had to stop. Free travel had to stop. Countries' cooperation, solidarity, unfortunately stopped. Some countries even hijacked the masks or disinfectants of others. So the EU could not pass the test of solidarity and brotherhood. But it is still a very important peace project. We have to go back to localization. People don't want Brussels to make all the decisions. People of Europe want to make their own elected local representatives to make decisions and they want to hold them accountable. So European Union will also have to change. As you said, if Turkey was a member, Europe could have done a much better job in dealing with it because our fatality rates per person and our test numbers are better than most, almost all of the European Union countries. But when we were investing in our healthcare, when we were building so many new hospitals, some countries were criticizing us that we are allocating way too much to health than defense. But we realized health is more important than defense. And I'm sure Europe will also understand that. But before we close, I want to say, 60 years after Martin Luther King said, I have a dream, we realized his dream still needs to be fulfilled. And this is a dream that needs to be fulfilled, not only in the United States, also in Europe, and we have to fight against discrimination. We have to fight against xenophobia. We have to fight against Islamophobia. We have to fight against all kinds of discrimination. And that's why you and your institutions are vital. The Alliance of Civilizations has a very huge responsibility to play, and I'm honored to work with you, and we have to achieve because we cannot afford to leave these standards to our children and to our grandchildren because it's going to become much, much more complicated if we don't deal with it now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, uh, Mr. Uh, Moratinos, Your Excellency, Mr. Bausch, uh, we would like to thank uh, uh, for our digital panel uh, for International Cooperation Platform for Bosphorus Summit uh, panel. Uh, we, ho uh, we host two excellent, uh, two honorable and dis distinguished uh, panelists uh, today on our digital panel. Uh, we would like to thank uh, your br brilliant uh, contributions uh, for the, for the, uh, for the uh, today and the future uh, of the international organizations and the institutions. Uh, uh, I hope uh, we will do uh, our summit at the beginning of the December. Uh, and I would like to see not another uh, second uh, wave uh, for the pandemic uh, and uh, maybe a, a very beautiful autumn uh, 
uh, without any pandemic uh, problem. So we would like to see both of you uh, in Istanbul in our uh, in our 11th uh, summit uh, for uh, Bosphorus summit uh, in Istanbul. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, wonderful panel for today. Thank you. We will be in Istanbul. Muchas gracias. Let's hope to see you in Istanbul. Okay. Muchas gracias uh, for today. Bye. Bye thank, bye. You, thank you, uh, for Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Have you. Have a nice day and weekend. Thank you. Thank you.